Yo, what's up everybody? Welcome to another episode of Downtime with Downstar, episode 199. And today we are here with the living legend, Rafael Estevez. Rafael, what's up, man? <laughs> How you doing? I want to say hi to all your fans out there and everybody that watches your podcast. Thank you, man. And I want to thank you for having me on the podcast. Oh, man, the pleasure is all mine, bro. You know, I've... Uh... I've been hearing about you for a long time, pretty much as, as, as long as I've been going out to the East Coast and, um, you know, spreading the word of the company and things like that out there. And then I become uh, uh, acquainted with uh, Javier Ortega from OGS 1320H Day. And um, that's where your name came up. And I was very, very, very shocked about your history, man. And that's something that I wanted to dig into today. Um, Okay. It's uh so before we get on, can you uh, just give us a quick breakdown of, of who you are and what you do? Well, my name is Rafael Estevez. I've been in the racing industry for I guess as long as I can remember. That's why Javier calls me grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I've been at it for for quite a while. I, I've been at it since I'm like maybe 16 years old. Uh, in the streets of New York, that was something that. You, we picked up, I mean, I picked up to get away from it all. It's not like we had, you know, we didn't have the best neighborhoods yeah. or anything like that. So we always found a way to entertain ourselves. And I used to work in my old Datsun 510. That's how I started. And basically it was just a Chilton book and read it and, you know, yeah. change parts here and there. And then it becomes a passion. Uh, you know, good thing that for me, it became what I make my living out of, and I enjoy it so far. So yeah, that's always a good thing. I love it, man, and I love stories like that because I know a lot of the listeners of the podcast. That's their dream one day, uh, is just to be able to turn their hobby into their their career, so they can do what they love every day that they uh, that they work. You know, and that's something beautiful about that. Yeah, a lot of people ask me if I went to school for it since, you know, I, I I basically, I do almost everything you can do in a car. I, you know, I build an engine, I, I, I work and put it in, I tune it, uh, you know, I drive the car. It's basically everything just because you, you, you get to grow a love for this that it goes beyond that what you can do. And when you love something, you're going to try your best. You know, you're going to do 200 percent, not even 100 yeah. percent. You're going to go 200 percent into it. And, you know, that's that's what I think I've done over the years. Yeah, definitely, man. So let's go ahead and start at the beginning. You say you were 16. Uh, paint the picture of to me what it was like uh, living in what was this, Washington Heights. Yes, I grew up in, in 183rd Street, Washington Heights. Um, today, that street owns my father's name, which I'm very proud of. My father was a, a worked in the community a lot, uh -huh. so they, they they put the name on that on the street. Oh, really? That of, yeah, that part of my block. What's the Last What's year. the street name? Rafael Estevez. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I'm very proud of that. Very cool. And um, that's where I grew up. Um, you know, at the, at, in the early '80s, uh, I came to New York in 1978, but um, I actually grew up in Puerto Rico. Got you. Got you. Um, I am originally born in Dominican Republic. Okay. But at two year old, after when I was two, my family decided to move to Puerto Rico, and I did most of my my early years there. And then we came in '78 to New York. Uh, you know, going to sixth grade and started. By the time I was in in junior high school, um, I kept seeing these cars, and 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 I was just in a bike. I was just in a bicycle. You know, that's all I could ride. Yeah. <laughs> could drive. So. Um, I used to go to a place in 190th Street. And I used to ride my bike there, and it was a park. And I used to see these gatherings or these, you know, nice-looking cars. I mean, couldn't make what it was at the time, but the colors, the rims, the shiny stuff, it calls your attention. And, and you see a group of people gathering around a car and, and, and around other people and, and, and going and stuff, and then it makes you curious and it, it, it caught my attention, and I actually kept going in a little bit more and more and seeing what it was about. Then I saw that there were rays, and I, and I, and I got to 
understand what they were doing after, after a while. You know, I'm, I'm just a kid and I can't go in there and ask questions anyway. So um, at that time, I was about 11 years old, 11, 12 years old. And from there, my that's where my love for cars started. Wow. So 11 or 10, you're on the streets and you see uh, you see these gatherings. What kind of cars did they have out there? I always, that's the thing. It, it's a funny story because I never saw American cars. It was always been imports. Mm-hmm. That's in 510s, Corollas, uh, you know, always, always imports. Mm-hmm. We had, they had some American cars, but it wasn't that that popular the the Datsun 510 which was my very first car was was a very popular car and uh 72 Corollas okay that was a very popular car around they people some people have like the Triumph the TR6 um so mostly import cars so that's why I guess I lean more towards the import side I guess yeah um I never been into the American cars at all really to this day yeah. yeah to this day got you so, so uh, 11 years old, you get bit by the bug, and um, by 16, is that when you got your first car? By like 17, yeah, um, I finally convinced my mother into giving me uh, a, a, a few dollars that I needed, and I, at that time, I used to have like DJ equipment. Gotcha. And I sold most of it, most of it and, and got the money in and chipped in, and I, it was only like 500 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> at the time. <laughs> so my mom gave me the rest and I bought this beat up that's a 510 got you so when yeah. uh, I love that sound man what are they dynoing back there <laughs> yeah they dynoing a Honda next time. oh nice I love it, man. So uh, at this time that you're you're selling all your equipment and you ask your mom to to let you borrow that money, uh, what is uh, what is her standpoint on you know you and this new hobby? Well, the the thing is, she was trying to keep me out of trouble since it wasn't the nicest neighborhood around. So, you know, I, 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 when you're a teenager, you want to keep a teenager busy. And that kept me pretty busy and, 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 and reading mm-hmm. because everything was in a, like I said, it was a children book. You couldn't go on the Internet and, and, and Google something or, find, or go to YouTube and find what you're looking for. You had to read. Yeah. So I keep getting these books and reading. So at least it, that, it kept that part of it alive so i guess that's that's what she was happy about got you uh, then you know i continue and i you know i must have put the motor apart a couple of times trying to figure that thing out it's like you don't know anything yeah. we just know how to do some bolts and we don't even know how to grab a ratchet or anything we don't even got the proper tools you know we were changing engines with with a pipe and a change you know two guys on one side and two guys on the other side pull it up <laughs> and that that was the streets of new york in in, in those days yeah so um, when you got into this new hobby and you start wrenching on these cars, did you start to make uh, new friends that were into the same thing? Yes. Uh, that's, that's something that started to happen fairly quick. Mm-hmm. Um, mostly from, from junior high school and high school the days, um, a lot of the people, will, we will talk about things. So we will we'll, we'll create groups here. And, you know, people maybe from 10, 20 blocks from me, with the same with the same thing that we will visit each other we still well, i still go on my bike yeah <laughs> and my car wasn't running yet. yeah <laughs> so oh i take the train um so i used to hang out in this place called thayer thayer street is it's probably like like a mile from my house got you got you there was a group of guys there that that were into cars as well and i hang down there so we hang out in different different blocks and different Parts of the uh, Washington Heights where you know there was other enthusiasm. We we exchange ideas and exchange parts. Um, you know we, we we were barely we were barely making ends meet. You know. Yeah. Okay. So we would trade a lot of parts and try to do what we can to to get the cars ready. Now you uh, early in your career as an enthusiast, did you um, did you realize that you had different skills or maybe better skills than than other people that you were meeting? On the on the on the mechanic side, no. Like I would understand a lot of the things, but on the driving side, yes, because mm-hmm. most people didn't like to drive, and I enjoy driving. Yeah, and you know, everywhere, every 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 light will be a drag race. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean. So. <laughs> 
So you start developing skills that you see that other people don't have. And, and at that time, we wasn't really racing. Nobody was racing around for money. We would just, like, whenever we went to any other races, you just stand there, uh, you stand in one lane, and whoever comes up, you guys race up, up the block, and that was it. Mm-hmm. That was what we called racing at those times. It was no money because we were all broke. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, so, so we would just race for race, just for the love of the money, for the love of the racing, not not, not for money. Just for bragging Until, rights. Like, yeah, on for bragging rights, correct. Like, oh, I beat you, or my motor's better. And it's not like we had, you know, 800, 1,000 horsepower cars. Now, the, uh, Datsun bro was only uh, 90 horsepower back then. Gotcha. So... Uh, at 90 horsepower, there's not much you can do. You can floor this thing forever. And, and you're not going anywhere anyway. We we do 100, 120, and we were flying. Yeah. So we thought. Yeah. <laughs> so at this time, and, where are you guys and, and, racing at? Well, there was a place where I used to go, 190th Street in, in Amsterdam. Mm-hmm. That was a, like a, a strip behind the, the local high school where it was the longest stretch. is about... It's about a little bit more than a quarter mile. It's, it's more than a quarter mile. A stretch where there's there's only, you know, one street. There's no other street crossing it. Gotcha. And it was a park and the, and the high school. Mm-hmm. So not too many people hang out around there. It was wide, too, because it had 90-degree parking because the, the people from the, the teachers from the high school would park there during normal days. So on Sundays, everybody would gather up there. It'll be a park, so the cops wouldn't bother you because it's a park anyway. And then there, we will do like maybe must have been like 150 feet because I think every pole is is a it's only it's, it's 50 feet or 100 feet apart. Gotcha. And we will race three poles on the same side of the street. Oh wow! So we will start from this pole to the third pole, yeah. and that was the race because it was short. Then we needed we needed room to break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So when you when you guys are out there racing, um. And say the cops did show up, what, did they even know what was going on? Or was this just so new that they, they didn't even know that this was kind of a, an established thing? Yeah, well, that's the good thing about those days. Like, those days were what I call the glory days for me. For the simple fact that not only did they didn't know what was going on, like, you, we just, like, we didn't even have registration, insurance in the car. We took a plate, we slap it on the car, and we're driving. That's it. That's what it was about. Yeah. Uh, we didn't even have a license. I didn't even have a license, a legitimate license then. And you used to get pulled over, and it's like, okay, you know, park the car and and walk. Yeah. Or, you know, you, you sometimes they didn't even give you tickets. They'll just, they'll just park you, and that was it. Yeah. So it was, it was, it was, I think it was a good, a good time, because you get away with a lot of things. Nowadays, this is a lot different. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> well, that that does sound like the good old days. So, um, so back then, when the cars only had ninety horsepower, who was the uh, who was the man on the street? Who was the fast the the fast car out there? Well, there were a lot of like I said, the the most the uh, the best cars that people used to soup up was the five ten and the, and the Corollas. The Corollas were really tough because they came with that Hemi engine. And a lot of people used to just put, you know, we used to put like a, a Weber carburetor on it and, and a cam, and that was it. That was that was most, most, mostly what people did. The, re, the, the people with really money or after maybe like in the, I would say in the late 80s, mid to late, mid, mid 80s, around 84, 85, a lot of people started to, to get into building engines and like, Benolia Pistons was one of the first company I ever heard of making pistons for an import. And 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 they, they those were the pistons that people were using at the time. And and then nitrous was being used a lot in the Corollas as well. Mm-hmm. Then the rotaries came around. Um, after I had my 510, my, my second car was the RX2. Mm-hmm. For the simple fact that a, a rotary was so fast with nothing to do. You just take... You know, in my RX2, I had an RX7, a, a first-gen RX7 motor with a header and a carburetor, and that thing went, was flying because it revved so high. Yeah. Um, so basically, you didn't have to do anything to it. So it was the the, the less expensive way to, to go fast. Yeah, got you. So when did you start to notice that um, 
Hondas were fast cars and good cars to start uh, modding. The first Honda I had was a 92 Civic. Okay. And then I had an Integra, a 94 Integra. Uh, and this was in the, in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. Okay. So about, about the same year. Gotcha. 95 or somewhere around there. And the first build that I did on a Honda was with a friend of mine. And there was a, a, a big race that was going to happen. We didn't have import racing here in, in, the, in, in any of the tracks. In English Town, Echo, we didn't have any of that. Um, we will go to the track on a test and tune days and we were like, you know, they will laugh at us like, oh, rice burners mm. and call us everything. And we had to take the abuse. You know, it was it was that type of thing. So we didn't even like to go to the track that much because we were that we was always get picked on mm. and they didn't have no respect for us whatsoever. So they were very, they so, were very um, vocal about it that you guys weren't wanted at oh, the track. Yeah. Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. That's why they say Akko was one of the first track to to bring in the imports, mm. because we weren't really like around around here in the in, in the track. I don't know if California was the same thing when you guys started, but uh, we weren't really like because we like we weren't going fast. We were going 14s, man. You yeah. know that was fine, 14s. So in 1996, we started building this Honda with a friend of mine. Um, and there was a, a, a an event here that was going to happen at Echo. Some guys from Florida came up, and it was called Street Wars. Okay. Uh, like we set our goal to finish the car and go to that race and, and run. And then at that time, the, the California cars were running. They were running like maybe I think twelves. Um, so we, you know, the Turbo magazines. Yeah. We keep seeing everything. So to us, it was we're on this side of town. We're looking at this, and we, you know. We want to we want to get get with it. This is this is import racing. Um, front wheel drive was that was something totally new for me. And we started building this car, and it's not like you can just go to the, you know, pick up the phone and call and let me get a set of rods, let me get a set of pistons. Yeah. Uh, I remember I had to wait like six weeks from Arias for a set of pistons. Uh, the rods were Crower. You know, uh, it was like everything was six weeks, eight weeks. Oh, wow. So it took us almost a whole year to build this thing. Wow. Um, we, um, you know, we, we finally got it going. And then after we have it going, George over at Rally Motorsport, George, that used to run the bullish car, helped us out with the tune. I didn't, I didn't tune at that time. We, I inst we installed the, the, it was a Haltech ECU. We installed it, but he tuned it. And then... You know, we're like probably like I think it was like a week or two weeks before the event, and then we find out that the you know we got a bullshit clutch. It doesn't even take the power. <laughs> <laughs> so we're like, where are we gonna get a we're we gonna get a clutch? You know, we're gonna get a clutch for this. We're like two weeks away, and and we're going, damn. Now you know we're trying to make power with this thing. We blew the clutch like a three hundred. We had no clutch anymore. Mm -hmm. So we're like, we know we can make more, but he's like, well, we gotta get a clutch. We gotta get a clutch. Um, the guys from Street Wars had some other sponsors, and that's how I met Chris Jules. That's the Chris Jules always says this story because uh, the way we met was a funny way. I it, that week I happened to get my appendix taken out mm. the week before the race, so he calls me at the at the hospital. I'm in the hospital bed. He goes, oh, I heard you need a clutch. And I said, yeah, we need a clutch, but I'm in the hospital. But I'm going to get out. <laughs> I'm going to go to the race. <laughs> so so he goes, well, I got a clutch for you. And I'm like, okay, what what do I have to do? You know, I, I mean, you know, what I have to pay because we spend a lot of money. And he goes, oh, you don't have to spend anything. I'm going to send you the clutch. I want you to put two rest tickets on the fender that says clutch master. Oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, send it over. <laughs> send it over. Yeah. So Chris, go ahead and, and send sends the clutch over. We put it in. You know, I'm in the hospital. They take the car over to the to to George, and he tunes it, and we end up making at that time 450 horsepower. So we stopped there. It was actually 454 on the dot, and we're like, that's it. That's good enough to go 11s. We're happy with that. We're gonna we wanna go there and try to do whatever we can. And at that time, we were running a quick 16, so it was. You know, all-wheel drive. Tito had his Porsche. Um, 
uh, you know, it was just a mixed bunch of cars. It wasn't front wheel drive like it is now, and, and they separated into three classes. We just have that one class, quick six, quick eight, and you had to get in there. If you didn't make it, you go home. Yeah. That's it. Uh, I think I qualified number three there with like an 1140 or 1160, something like that, uh -huh. which we were happy because the very first pass on the car was a 12, uh, 12 two. I was making bets with people that I was going to go 11s, but nobody wanted to bet. Everybody was scared until they saw the car run. So when they saw the car run, I said, look, I didn't run the 12s. You guys, you guys would have won. You want still got a chance if you want to bet. But everybody said, nah, we're <laughs> now we're definitely not going to bet. I try to get people to bite. And then the very next pass, I went like at 1180 right off the bat. So this was the uh, that white EG with the, the, the white turbo right. GSR setup in it? Yes. Got it. It was 1136. Yeah. Correct. So we were we were we were running we were we were running like well, I qualified number three and that Tito had his Porsche. He wasn't running that fast. He's like, I'm not running him. <laughs> uh, I remember I ended up running. Uh, I think it was. Uh, I think it was with Shepard. Mm -hmm. I ran with Shepard that that time. He he eliminated me the first round. Gotcha. Uh, I didn't have much experience. I had like. A track experience at all. Yeah. I had a, a, a H -A HKS EVC, which I will have in low, and then as I went to third, I would switch to to, to high boost. Yeah. You know, it was that type of <laughs> <laughs> that type of thing. Trying to get the most out of the car, everything was manual in there. You moving a bunch of buttons <laughs> <laughs> to get it to go down the track. Yeah. So, but I got eliminated on the first round, but I left happy because I left with a with a good uh, with a good run. Um, Sean Carson at that time, you know, God, God bless his soul, took pictures of the of the manifold because he was very interested in that it was an equal length. And, you know, since he was a fabricator, um, he, he, he drew a lot of interest in the car. He was he, there was a lot of pictures taken at that event, mm -hmm. which I still got the turbo magazines for it from it. Uh, and it was he, he, what he mentioned about about the, the, the manifold. That was the, the ram horn manifold, which I was the first one to have it, but it was made by Cooks. Mm -hmm. Cooks built that manifold for me. No, and then I, a couple of years later, then everybody had, had that style of manifold. So you're saying that this was the first style of the ram horn before that? You've never seen that style before? Nobody, nobody ever seen that. Um, I can send you pictures of the of the Turbo Magazine where, where he talks about it because I have them all. I, I keep them all as a reference. Wow. Uh, and actually, Sean was saying this is an equal length header, first one I ever seen, and he wrote a little caption of it. Yeah. And that's how I guess I got introduced into the Honda world, basically. I love it, man. God, that's so much history. So uh, just to recap, that was back in '96. '97. Ni '90. That was June. It was June of 97, that event. 97, guys, uh, making yeah. 450 horsepower on a turbo GSR. Yep. That's awesome, bro. So, that, was so at, at this time, obviously, they're running faster here in California. Just tell me about it. Um, we've had a lot of the OGs from California on the podcast, so we're pretty familiar with, with the story of things here. But as far as the East Coast... I, I'm I'm trying to tie it all in together. So tell me what it was like in '97, uh, a racer in the Honda community. What what was it like? How did you even know about the guys on the West Coast and who were the the guys that you were looking at competition uh, on the West Coast and even in your area as well? Who were some of the other big dogs? Okay. Well, the way we heard about the West Coast guys was the Turbo Magazine, Super Street. You know, remember, those were the days where no internet, like I said, we were wait the first of the month. You know what we were. Yeah. We were running to that place to get that magazine and see if it was there. Oh, it's <laughs> out. I got it first. You know, that's how it was. Oh, you saw. Then everybody calling each other and say, you saw you saw this on Turtle Magazine. No way. <laughs> yeah. And that was, that was the bragging rights, like whoever made it to to Turbo Magazine. Mm -hmm. or and, and then that's how we, 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 we got familiarized with the West Coast guys. Um, I happened to open the shop with Javier in November of 1997. Okay. Um, we, Javier had a, uh, Javier's always, always think ahead of his time, like I said. So he had an idea since we were opening up the shop, we're going to be dealing with everything was in the West Coast. Yeah. We didn't have any parts here. We have to get 
the, the parts from everywhere in the, in the West Coast. JG. So Javier's like, look, we're going to open this, this shop. There's a battle of the impulse race. Why don't we go out there and we take the trip and we meet everybody on the trip and we go to the race. Wow. I said, oh, bet, bet, let's go. Uh, I didn't know anybody out there. I didn't know a single person. Uh, spoke to some people on the phone. When we first got, we, we got there on uh, uh, before the race. So the first place we went was JG. When we get there, like everybody that's on Turbo Magazine actually works there. <laughs> you know, at that yeah. time it was Steph, it was Steph, JoJo, everybody. I'm like, everybody works here. <laughs> no wonder, yeah. no wonder they go fast. Everybody works in the same place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, and then at, at that time, Steph was beginning to open on um, Panda Pro with Vietnam. So, uh, we we actually met all those guys in that trip. Mm -hmm. uh, Jojo, JG, JG, we spoke to him a lot. We told him how we're opening a shop and we want to do business. So, it was a great thing because we got to meet everybody in face. So, whatever we used to talk on the phone... We had a, we had a, 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 you know, we had a face to the, yeah, to the, yeah, to the voice. definitely, a face to the voice. It, it, it was, it was a good thing. Uh, we also went to Miles, mm -hmm. uh, Miles Batista. Yes. He, he was. I still talk to Miles to this day. <laughs> yeah, Miles is a great guy, man. Yeah. So you know, we got, we got to meet all those guys, and then when, when I go to the race, I see a familiar face, because I, I don't know anybody there, but I see Kirk, Kirk Miller from AM. Okay. Uh, he was working on Fran Choi's RX-7, which I, I sent him a picture of that the other day. Yeah. And that was the only person I knew in the West Coast. Because <laughs> he was actually from here, from Jersey. Uh, Kirk was actually from here. Kirk, is he still with AEM to this day? Yeah. Pretty. Yeah, correct. Is he a tall still, guy? Yeah. Yeah, he's gotcha. the vice president of sales. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. yeah, I actually, uh, I met him. Yeah, he's still living out in the West Coast since since then. He moved around uh, the early 90s. Gotcha. The, the, um, the middle middle to early 90s he moved out to california got you okay man that uh that's crazy dude you know like i said we've had so many og racers in uh on the podcast uh you know steph miles um uh, ron bergenholtz and it's so wild that all the stories all just come back to jg engine dynamics yeah that's uh yeah that was that was the he was the start of the Honda stuff. He definitely was. Yeah. Um, whoever, is, whoever wants to say something different doesn't know the story. Um, like I said, you know, everybody picked up a, a Turbo Magazine or a Super Street at those times, Sports Compact. Mm -hmm. That was all you saw. Yeah. I mean, starting from his ads everywhere, every car had a JG sticker. Yeah. Every car you saw, no matter whose it was, had a JG sticker. An important part of buying Honda parts online is making sure that you can trust the company that you're dealing with to get you the right parts reliably. You're spending a lot of money and you spent a lot of time researching your build. The last thing that you may want to do is send cash to a website where you may never see it again and worse yet never see parts. With Heel Toe Automotive, an 18 year history track record is part of the deal. Heeltoe brings you deep industry connects, professional parts recommendations, alternative ideas when your parts aren't available, and will even contact you if something on your order looks out of ordinary before it ships. Heeltoe's unique checkout allows you to select a deadline to receive your parts to make sure you get them in the time for your project plans. You can buy parts online anywhere, but Heeltoe knows what truly matters to an enthusiast. Professionalism, swiftness and accuracy heel toe is in your corner visit heeltoeauto.com or you can call or text at 949-295-1668 and make sure you check them out on instagram at heel toe automotive now at, at this time um did you realize that you were embarking on something special you know making this cross-country trip going to JG, seeing all the guys from the magazines. Yeah, um, I don't know. I, don't, I, I For myself, I can't say that I thought it would be like that. Maybe Javier was because it was his idea. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe he had that vision. Or maybe we just did it to introduce ourselves, which 
at that moment, maybe I, I didn't think so. Mm-hmm. But as we started to do business and getting on the phone and ordering parts and becoming dealers for different people and, and, and everybody had to buy stuff from us, that made a big difference, yes. Got you, got you. That was the started. Okay, cool. Uh, now that you mentioned Javier, how did you guys end up meeting? Uh, we met at a, like a, like a part store. Um, I, it was a, like an, a, it, it was called Eastern mm-hmm. and people used to hang out there. And I, and as I was building the car, I went, I went to get parts there as well. Sometimes we needed parts. They had it. We'll go get them. And that was in Queens. I was building the car in Yonkers. So we're talking about like a 30 minute ride. And I met him there and I, and, and I said that I, we started talking what we were doing. Then he came and visit the shop where I was building the car. He was always interested in it. He had a little EG with a LS motor that afterwards uh, on, a friend of mine and I uh, built for him uh, where we got good, good, decent power. He was, he was going 13s in it in, with a LS, mm-hmm. which was fast at that time. And that's how we met. And he always pushed me to, oh, let's open a shop. Let's open a shop. I was like, I don't know, you know, so... The shop really didn't start like a great business. We started more like as a fun type of thing. Yeah. And it was, it, uh, you know, some people might not think think of it like this, but it was very scary at the time. Uh, we're, we're investing with what we thought was a lot of money, which wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> into this thing. And we don't know what's going to happen. And, you know, once I dedicated to that, that was all I was doing. And at the beginning, the shop is not leaving the amount of money where we can support ourselves. So it's like it, it, it's really tricky on your mind because you start to think, well, yeah, I, I, I want this to succeed and I have this dream and I want this to happen. But, you know, I also have a life and my life in the other, my real life is, is falling apart. Mm. Like, how long can I last doing this? And, and you begin to have thoughts how if this is going to be successful it's not we didn't know anything about business whatsoever so everything we will have to go and ask like to incorporate to do but everything was going through lawyer to do this paying everybody to do that so we we getting short on cash and then you know we it, it's not going as planned we're not becoming millionaires right away yeah <laughs> <laughs> so so we thought we were going to be yeah. and but um, you know, in a, in a few months, the, 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 the shop starts to build up. Customers kept coming in. Um, the, we were doing a lot of great swaps at that time, and we were, like, one of the only ones doing it. So it, it, we started to build a reputation. Then in, in, in May 98 is when the article comes out. That's when the, the Racer X... Gotcha. article comes out for for um buy magazine so that also puts us more in, in the map and everybody starts to talk about it so everybody starts to come to the shop and then the shop starts to pick up and grow got you got you now that's definitely something i want to get into before i do that um you know javier is a, a huge staple in the community and um I think with a lot of things, if he wasn't able to do them, the community wouldn't be in the position that it's in. He always seems like he has a way of foreseeing what the future is going to be and brings the future uh, to life. Now, did you notice those skills in him in a in a younger in his younger age of like, yo, I see this shop, we could turn this into something? Yeah, well, we did. It, it was funny. We used to argue all the time because. I did. I did the 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 wrenching part of the of the of the shop. Yeah, I was changing the parts, doing the swaps. He ran the office side of it. So we used to argue a lot because Javier would go one bolt fifty cents, <laughs> and I'm like, dude, dude, <laughs> how you gonna put a bolt? You know, just add it onto the bill somewhere. <laughs> Because when the guy comes and he says, you charging me for a boat, we're going to sit here and argue with him for days. <laughs> oh, man. But, but he, was, he was that type of guy. He's like, I want to I wanna have everything detailed for him so he understands where the money went and all that. I'm like, I understand. But like people here, they want to know it's 20 bucks and they want to pay their 20 bucks and leave. They don't want to say, oh, where did the 20 bucks yeah. win? If they ask, then you tell them, look, it's that. But. When you tell him 50 cents for a ball, then he's going to say, come on, you're going to charge me 50 cents for a ball? 
<laughs> they don't understand we have to buy the boat as well. Yeah. <laughs> That's oh, funny, man. That's not, I've, I've actually heard that before. You know, it's it's very, very detailed of what's done to the car, which is like, it's amazing because you know what you're paying for. You know the time that it takes. But then when you start looking into it, you're like, come on, man, you're charging for a zip tie. <laughs> Yeah, which is, you know, it's the right way to do it yeah. because, you know, you, you, we have to buy it ourselves. But you just have to build it, build it, it this is what it is, and, and, and build the major parts. And the little parts, just throw it into the into the build, to, yeah. more or less, because the customer would always argue. So we learned that. We learned that at a very early age. We, we, remember, we, we opened a business without having any business skills or anything like that. Yeah. So We had to learn as, as we went. Yeah. So, um prior to may 98 just paint the picture of to me what it's like having the shop and and what are your what are your what's your free time like are you guys going to races every night or what's it, what's it like we we were we were trying yeah like we that, that's one thing we had here in new york we had a lot of racing a lot of racing every night from 10 o'clock on there'll be different places to meet that that's always been a good thing in, 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 in the in the tri-state area yeah because you know you got to include Jersey and, and and all of all of um, all of New York all of New York City um, so there, there'll be a lot of places to meet where there'll be Horns Point um, the Bruckner uh, the Hutch which the Hutch has been you know that's 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 one of the highways here mm -hmm. and, and at the Hutch people have been racing since the 50s. You know, so we, we didn't discover that as import. That was all American territory. That was all American. Most of the people in the hutch was American cars. Gotcha. Until, until we started getting fast because we will catch these guys because they'll look at the at an import and say, what can that run? But once they realize these little Hondas were going, they, they respect it. Then that's when they, the respect started to come around. Mm -hmm. Now, um, did uh, after you guys start running these, these numbers... Um people start to realize that these Hondas and these imports are fast. Did the atmosphere change at the track? What, what really made them realize wasn't actually the number because we were going like 1130s out of 133. Mm. Now the mile an hour was what was getting them because they're like, wow, they should be going like nines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> With 133, 135, 140, those were the mile an hours we were getting. So we were getting a lot of mile an hour plus we were running the cars we didn't have uh, a big set of uh, uh, tires that you can get all you can get was the little 15 by 23s at that time mm -hmm. that was the only tire you can get which was an m and h was an m and h tire mm -hmm. uh, 15 by 23 and that's what we were running i would drive the car with no rear seats just the two front seats no roll cage no nothing put these two slicks on Boom, go 11.30 and get kicked out of the track. <laughs> <laughs> so, so everybody's like, oh, man, that thing is fast. So the, the bike guys was one of the guys, the first guys to start realizing. They used to gather up and say, come on, come look at this car, man. It's going to go like 130. <laughs> it, was, it was funny because th those were one of the first guys at the tr track that, that came, at least to me, and started saying, what you got under there? You know, let me see what you have. I said, well, it's just a little Honda motor with a turbo. That's what it is. Yeah. Uh, it was the beginning of the turbo area as well. Like we didn't know much about turbo. Remember, running 14, 20 pounds of boost was crazy in those days. Yeah, you know that was like uh, that was like insane. Yeah, <laughs> running that much. Boost. It's, it's a it sounds like a new era was about to approach. Yep. Yeah. So so let's so, go ahead. And you know, we begin to find we begin to find the weakness of the motors as well. That's when we start, uh, you know, knowing about the sleeves. Um, that, that was what a good relationship that came from, from, from going out to California and from that event here in, in Akko, that since I met Sean, he made us black guard dealers in the East coast. So we, were the, the, so you have to buy it from us no matter what. Mm -hmm. So that was a good, that was a good thing for him. Got you. That was from that. Yeah, that's definitely, um. I could see that being a good trip, especially without having social media. You know, the best way to make these relationships is person to person. I still feel like that to this day. Yeah, yeah. Social media was the magazine. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta wait a month. You gotta wait a month for social media. <laughs> yeah. So let's uh, 
let's let's get into it man i was uh i was speaking to javier earlier and uh he was giving me a little bit of the backstory so he said that he met um kenneth lee and uh K- right. kenneth he w- wrote he was uh he was um he worked for the daily news and um yes. he was putting together a, a story for the daily news and um then he wanted to put together a, a another story that had to that reflected the uh, the racing, and that's when Javier introduced him to you. That's correct. Yeah, he was actually he went to a local track that was in Long Island, which is closed now, and he was actually not writing for Vibe magazine. He was writing for like the Sunday paper on the the Sunday part of the paper on Daily News. Yeah. They gave him a, a story, and he wanted to talk about street racing because a lot of people didn't know like. It, even though we were like everywhere, you will ask people that had nothing to do with it. Do you know about any street racing in New York? No, that doesn't happen here. Yeah, because it will happen late at gotcha. night, and those guys are sleepy. You know? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, ready to go to work the next day. Our work time is at night. Yeah. <laughs> so he wanted to write about that, and and he did. He wrote about it. Uh, afterwards, Vibe gives him a, a, a he approaches Vibe. He wanted to do a freelance for them about street racing in New York, they give him the go ahead. They don't tell him how much he has. So he thought he might have maybe, we started this saying it was gonna be probably like a quarter of a page. Gotcha. Just a small write up on, on this. As as he means Javier, he was actually gonna do the story on somebody else. That's the funny thing. Mm. But the guy didn't speak too much English. So it, it was very hard for him to communicate with him because he doesn't speak Spanish. So he keeps, he keeps asking people, you know, who should I talk to? So everybody he will ask, who should he um, interview will, will say my name, Ralphie, Ralphie, Ralphie. So he's like, who's this Ralphie guy? I keep hearing him, but I never see him. So until one day that I, we, we were at a race and I get out of my car, and Javier always makes fun of that. Because he said I, I got out with my leather jacket and my shoes. <laughs> And I was going, you know, I was, like I said, it was a race, but I was going to go out afterwards. So I'm like, I'm ready to go, man. I'm just going to race, get my money. And So what and was your step. outfit? Tell me the outfit. You know, I, you know, I had jeans with, with, with pointy shoes. What you use at the time and a leather jacket. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, this guy don't even look like a racer. Look. <laughs> so... That's how I met him. Okay. And we started we started talking and meeting in different places and and, and I kept I, I kept showing them the different the different areas of New York. Uh, and then we would sit and he would ask me questions and he would write it. And, and um, it really took a while for that story to go through. Which uh, uh, at the beginning when when he was, he came with the camera and all that, people was in happy with him taking pictures mm. you know where's street races They're like come on man no pictures i had to like get him in there and say look he's okay i know him and you know there won't be any plays there'll be just you know no faces there'll be just some some part of it which you can see a lot of pictures on the articles like blurry mm-hmm. and that's why he because he'll move the camera to make it blurry and all that stuff just to because to, he wanted some pictures to, to actually put um but he took so long doing the story that at some point i'm going is this guy like for real? Like you see, I, I know he write for. I saw the story on the Daily News, but is this guy a cop or something? Because <laughs> we went like two years, man. Wow, no way. Yeah, we went like two years talking about talking about like the 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 the, the places to raise, uh, my life story. Like he wrote everything. He had more than those two pages that he wrote. Yeah. And he even got a ride. Like at the end, at the end of the story, he said, "Look, I think I have enough to do the story." He, he. It, it, if you look at the reunion, the vibe reunion where, where him and I are talking about it, he never forgets that day because he said, "I want to ride in the car. I want to ride down the mile in the car and see what it feels like." Yeah. I, okay, no problem. So I was with a friend. We had no back seats. Yeah. But my friend gets in the back, so he gets in the front. And I'm doing uh, like 140, 150 down the mile. And my, my friend is with a Dixie cup with, with alcohol in it. He, he goes, yo, slow down so I don't, so I don't, <laughs> I don't drop my liquor. He keeps saying that story all the time. 
He goes, I couldn't believe the guy's just sitting in the back. No seat, no seat belts. And he's talking about his Dixie cup that he's going to drop. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, it, it was that in the reunion. He, he talks about all that. But that was the final part of the story. He said, I want to feel like get a feeling for the car because he's listened to everything I said. And and but he's never been like in a car really fast. Yeah. As a matter of fact, he didn't even know how to drive stick. And he bought a Honda uh-huh. and it was automatic. And I converted it to stick for him. And Javier and I go to deliver the car to him at the Daily News uh, office downtown. Yeah. And I said, okay, here's the car, you know, I give him the car and I said, okay, goodbye. He goes, wait a minute. I said, okay, but there a problem? He goes, can you give me a quick crash course on stick? I'm like, <laughs> no, man. no, no way, no way. This guy does not know how to drive stick. And it's like, we're in Manhattan, dude. How am I going to teach you how to drive stick in Manhattan? The traffic is insane. <laughs> And this dude is like, just give me a, I'm a quick learner. Give me a quick course. I'm like, I can't believe this is happening to me. Javier, Javier was just laughing. Javier was dying laughing. So Javier is following us and I'm here showing you got to do this. And then I get, I get off and he gets in and it's like, okay, slowly on the clutch. Blah, blah. I said, okay, look, you can make it home, man. I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> I got to go. You can make it home. That's all I said. Uh-huh. So, like, I said, just call me when you get home, man. You know, I want to know you got home safe or whatever. Yeah. So the guy left. He, You know, he took the whole night. He spent the whole night to perfect how to drive stick. Mm. And the next day he called me. He goes, yeah, I already got it. I got it down packed all last night. My roommate was showing me and and, and all this. I'm like, you you crazy. Are you going to make a car stick and you don't even know how to drive <laughs> So that's how I met his his roommate. And his roommate is the the guy who actually did the logo for us. Okay. His roommate was an an interior designer uh-huh. in, in in Manhattan, and and we did a couple of work on his car. So he wanted to do. He said, "Can I design a logo for you guys?" And he was the one who came up with that DRT logo. And that's the one they use to this day. That's the one. Wow. That I used to. Yeah. And the funny part is that the logo he. Took that picture from 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 the fl- the first t- from Turbo magazine yeah. that Sean took, and he says that the D that's why he the D is like a curve and the R is a curve. He said those are like the headers and the pipes. You know, uh. you know those artist guys have a meaning to everything. <laughs> yeah. So he explained it to me. I'm like, whatever. I like we like the thing too. That's it. <laughs> wow, <laughs> you know, dude. <laughs> I love it. And to this day, the funny thing is that I don't even have to say the drag racing technology part. Everybody looks at the DRT and, and they already know the logos. Yeah, I love it, man. So yeah. the, the time that you meet Kenneth, the time that you spend with him, what is your what is your idea of him and what is your idea of the whole story together? What are your thoughts about it? Um, well, at the beginning, it was it was it was it was complimenting to be asked all these questions and and uh, coming from the neighborhood that I came we weren't paying much attention Mm -hmm. so the attention that he's he's showing me and to me is a guy from a newspaper is an important guy so it was it was very overwhelming and I and I I, I was really I I really liked that the feeling of it Um, when it was taking long I'm like Dude, this is not going to go on forever now. You know what I mean? I got other things to do. Gotcha. <laughs> so I'm getting a little desperate. But and he kind of noticed that. But, you know, we stopped for a while. Then we started back again. It was it was, it was, was like that. You know, get a little break. And then we'll meet up again and, and stuff like that. So by the time we opened the shop that he calls me, he goes, look, man, the magazine is out. When he called me with that, I'm like, I can't believe it. He never even told us that, that he finished the story. Okay. But he did call us to sell it that it was out. We went out, Javier and I went out to the nearest um, place and bought the magazine and started reading and read the whole thing. We were laughing, you know, we were just laughing as we read it. And everything ended there. We we kept in touch. We kept in touch um, through the years. And then one day he calls me and he goes, uh, you know, I got an agent. I think I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna sell this as a, as a movie or something. That's when I just like really laughed to say this guy is really nuts, <laughs> and I said whatever, dude. You know, <laughs> g- 
good have a good life yeah. whatever happens it's good <laughs> i'm okay you know i i didn't do it i didn't do it for money yeah that that i i, I did that as just like i said we came from a, a, a messed up neighborhood. It was a tension and that was it. We didn't care about money or anything like that. Yeah. Um, the fact that the story was made about me was a big thing for me. Yeah. Um, when, when the movie comes out, that's when I get the call again from him. This is like 2001. Downtime with Downstar would like to welcome our newest sponsor, Rywire Motorsport Electronics. Rywire has been around since 2005, supplying you with solutions for all of your motorsport electronics needs. Whether you need a simple ECU adapter, engine harness, chassis harness, or PDM setup, they can get you taken care of. Offering products for most popular engine platforms from Honda, Toyota, Nissan, GM, hey, even Lamborghini. And if you have any private label needs, they can also take care of that as well. Rywire is the leader in motorsport electronics in our community, and we're excited to have them part of the Downtime with Downstar star family please please make sure you guys support rywire you guys could check them out at rywire.com or on instagram at rywire underscore motorsport underscore electronics i know it's long guys if you just search rywire it will pop up and if you're searching make sure you search them on youtube and you can check out their youtube channel where they are working on their new ev s2000 build we're super excited for that and we're super excited for rywire to be part of the downtime with downstar family so please guys make sure you go show rywire some love and tell them that downtime with downstar sent you once again that's rywire.com well let, let, let's not skip away because um hopefully everybody can can piece this together but i want to i want to actually explain what this turned into so the magazine comes out what was the actual month and year issue of it May May nineteen ninety eight. Uh, May ninety eight, and that's Vibe magazine, and yeah. the cover, if I'm not mistaken, was what like Cash Money or No Limit. No, the the cover was Master P. Master P. That's P no Master Limit. P, that's when Master P got big, and 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 it was the big fight with uh with uh Doctor Dre. Oh, and gotcha. They were saying that Master P was bigger than him and all that stuff, but. That's when Master P really made it big. Yeah. And he was on the cover of Vibe. Got He's you. Yeah. Um, there's actually the show out right now, the No Limit show. I think it's on BET. But uh, he was he was definitely a hustler from early on, man. He was able to hustle the uh, the music game. And uh, I'm pretty sure he was bigger than Dr. Dre back then. Yeah. <laughs> so, 98, you get the call from Kenneth. Hey, magazine's out. You and Javier, go get it. You read it. And... From that point on, mission accomplished. Correct. Yeah, and the, the the story was called Racer X. Racer X. Okay. Which which it was something that I that I asked him like, why would you name a Racer X? Like, and you know, he 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 did explain it to me, and he, and he explains it in the reunion as yeah. well. He said, um, well, Racer X was a you know the 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 cartoon racer. And and that's what he got like all the all the things because nobody knows about me. So the cartoon, the cartoon is a racer. So his name was Racer X. So I'm Racer X because nobody knows me. <laughs> got you. Is that from a uh, Speed Racer? Yeah, Speed got Racer. Got you, correct. got you. Okay, so Racer X from Speed Racer. That's why he chose the name. Right. Awesome. So that's why he. Chose the name. So uh, not how. When did he give you a call and tell you that he wants to um, sell the story as a to the as a script? It was a little bit after. After the story came out, I think it was about ninety nine. Got probably. you. Got you. Got you. It was before the two thousand. I know that. So there had to be some. Yeah, there had that to be some buzz, while. right? Well, there had to be some buzz around the story, and and it's gaining some interest. I guess since he's in that type of world, that like that wasn't my world. Like yeah, by that that's the that's another interesting part of that story. Buy magazine is not a car magazine. Mm -hmm. It's not a magazine that I used to go and pick up. It's a music and entertainment magazine. Yeah. And they decided to do this story that is totally out of their content. Yeah. For everybody listening that's not familiar with Vibe magazine, it would be if uh, Complex, if they had a magazine. It was uh, like Vibe, Source magazine. Um, you know, it was more, ge more geared towards the uh, sort of like hip hop urban culture of things. All right. Gotcha. Got so so that, that magazine... 
when when it is is grabbing attention of other people other than than racers and people that deal with cars. So I guess somebody must have contacted him through there. Mm-hmm. It's I never spoke about that that part with him because I never wanted anything from it. Yeah. Other than that. And when the when the movie uh, was about to happen, I did he did come to me uh-huh. and I went around with 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 a writer because the movie was actually going to be filmed in New York. A lot of people don't know that. Yeah. But the movie was, was going to be filmed in New York originally. Uh, I don't know if it was a budget issue or permits issue. Um, I I really don't know what caused it to be moved to to L.A. or to California. Got you. So he ends up selling the script to Universal, and Universal turns that into Fast and Furious. Correct. Got you. Okay. So um, before we get to that part, the magazine comes out, and within that year or so, before he contacts you, what is some of the... um, the um, response that you're getting from the magazine in your culture is is very is it, it, is very weird. It was a mixed bag, and it was it was it was funny because it's one of the things that caused me. I never talked about the magazine for a long time. Mm-hmm. I never talked about the story. I didn't want to talk about it because at the beginning it was it was made fun of. Mm. And it's like, oh, is, is that really you? It's like, look, I don't got nothing to prove, whatever. If you want to believe it, believe it. Mm. And when the movie came out, it was said, because remember, only a few people know that he saw the story and the movie was made. And when the movie comes out, there's no credits, there's no nothing towards me. Yeah. So a lot of people start disbelieving what it is. Yeah. That it was about the story and, and all this. But if you pay attention to a lot of details in the movie, you see that, yeah, there's so, you know, it's Hollywood. Yeah. They, they did stuff that is out of the story, of course, because it's Hollywood and, and you, want, you want excitement. Yeah. So he calls you and he tells you that it's going to turn into the movie. Universal picked it up. Now, um, then they they contact you or he puts you in a c- contact with them to uh you know scout some uh, locations in new york no actually actually he calls me and he goes that there's a writer coming from universal over and and if i will meet with them and at that time i was at the shop i told javier yeah javier this guy's gonna come yeah okay well i'll go around with him and whatever the guy even rented like a mustang and wanted me to drive i was like dude what what is this <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> like so it, it was funny but we spent we we went out we went out early and I started showing him the different spots where we raced and then we came back afterwards when the people were beginning to meet. Gotcha. And we ended up to like four thirty in the morning wow. going after a race that the cops kept coming to different places. And that's one of the one of the scenes that that, that I, always, I, I I I I pointed it out right away because when I went to see the the movie I went with Ken. Okay. And I said you know he wrote that part I know he did because the part where they first come and meet with all the music and all the cars in, in the first movie he wrote that part and that's what he saw like it's, it's, it's it was funny to see that because I knew what the writer saw and how he took this and, and put it into into perspective in the movie and wrote it and it was what he saw like it's, it, 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 it was something like for me, it was like impressive because I'm like, wow, this guy saw this mm-hmm. and he had to write about it. So other people actually acted out and it was actually acted out the way he saw it. Yeah. Which to me is one of the parts in the movie that is the most authentic when it comes to street racing. When they first come and all the cars are there, the means, you know, the car means the way it, that's like the most original part that 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 i liked about i like the movie got you he wrote he wrote that part so when you would come to the meets would it be like that first scene when you roll up everybody's looking and oh man that's him yeah everybody oh you drive around the car everybody's gonna look at you and you know what car you're driving and, and and who's this if they don't know you especially like like us in new york we will go we will go to brooklyn the bronx you know manhattan so manhattan was my area like everybody knew me but when I went to the Bronx, like, who's this guy? Yeah. 
and you know, you had to be careful. Those days were gang days and stuff like that. And, and you, you got to come in nice. You can't come in all loud into a different neighborhood because stuff can happen yeah. <laughs> really quick. <laughs> stuff can elevate really quick. Yeah. So that's that's the way that's the way it was back then. But you you, you know you learn how to deal with it. You you we're, we're at the end we're racing, and when we begin to talk racing, everything gets forgotten. Who you are is we're gonna race, and that's the end of that story. Yeah. So um, when did you realize that it was actually becoming a movie? They're filming it, and it's it's coming out in theaters. What was that feeling like? Well, I, re- I realized it when 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 the guy came to with Ken. I, I figured, well, oh, this is this is really happening. Um, but it was still a year after that mm-hmm. before the, the movie came out. He came like a year a year before the movie was filmed pretty quick. Gotcha. It was it was filmed pretty quick after after everything happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he calls me and and, and tells me that the movie's going to be out that. They're going to have it as a premiere in 86th Street and, and Broadway that if I want to go, I'm like, but what happened to the filming in New York? <laughs> <laughs> How is the movie done? Because <laughs> they, they actually told me that because I, that I, I said, what's, you know, what would be in it for me? Like, of course, I'm, I'm helping around. What's in it for me? Everybody's making money. Here. Yeah. So he was he said I was going to be like a technical advisor or something. Like yeah. That. I'm like, OK, whatever. You know, whatever the time comes, I'm here, whatever. They didn't, they didn't believe it, yes, if it was true or not. But when he tells me about the movie, I'm like, damn, what happened? I'm, I'm left out. Shit. <laughs> I'm left out. So whatever. We go, we go to see the movie, and, and, and all the critics were there. They actually, I, I didn't know this about movies, that they do, they actually do like a premiere with regular people, so the critics hear the reaction of the crowd. Mm. So... That 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 was a I that's this is I found all this out after the movie because I'm talking to the Universal people. Yeah. So, oh, why there were so many people here for this? Oh, we 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 give some tickets to people so they can see the reaction, and that turns out to be good for the for the actual critics because they're gonna write about the movie in the in, in, in a paper or in the news or somewhere else. So they want to see the excitement about it. Gotcha. So when the movie is there, you know, it's the end. I stay there to the last. Letter comes up to see if there's any credits. Oh, shit. <laughs> I see everybody's name except mine. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, okay. Who got to tell them, dude? They could at least give me credit. I, I opened a shop, you know, six months ago. It would have been nice for me yeah. or whatever. But I, after seeing the movie, I'm like, man, nah, maybe I didn't want to be related to this thing anyway because <laughs> it was crazy. They made a bunch of mistakes. And, you know, I pointed out a bunch of mistakes they made and all that stuff there. <laughs> so, but it was all fun. Uh, at that time and i'm like okay whatever so this was the summer of 2001 mm-hmm. um i think it was june or july somewhere around there. i know it was hot yeah i know it was it was summer here and then in january 1st he calls me back in december and he goes i got a surprise for you i said oh yeah what's up he goes look the dvd is coming out january 1st and I actually spoke to them and got them to put um, your name in it and the story. So there's going to be something called um, bonus tracks and the story is going to be there and it's going to say everything about the story and that the stories about the movie and all this. And I said, oh, wow, that's great. So I'm like, man, January 1st, I'll be the first one in that door to buy that, that thing. Yeah. And, uh, and I did. I bought it. And I saw the bonus track. It had the story. It has everything. But six months later, there was a little issue. <laughs> and they pulled every DVD back. No pulled- way. So whoever has a Fast and the Furious DVD that was bought in, like, after June 2002 doesn't have that. Wow. So there's a limited copy out there. There's limited copies out there that have the bonus tracks. I, I still have it. I have mine. Wow. Got it. There's limited. There's very limited tracks. They only ran it for like three to six months. And then it was all pulled back. Can you tell from the cover which version it is? In the back. In the back. If you, it, when, when you turn it around, uh-huh. it will say 
bonus bonus coverage and then the, this the racer x is is on a box wow guys if anybody has that copy please let me know we need one for the studio <laughs> wow yeah so, so if you don't if you don't have the original copy it won't have the, those bonus tracks so it was um i think it was like 15 20 minutes extra of how the movie was made the story that it was yeah. made on the story and and and, and all that Wow. So before we move on past the the movie, uh, I just want to go over the movie a little bit. What were some of the more uh, similarities that you realized that they they did a good job on, such as like you said the the opening scene with uh, where they meet up at the races? Well, that was one of them. Then when when they chase when they chase Toretto, that that he's in the RX seven and he pulls into into a garage. That was something that wasn't in the story that really happened to me on my 300CX. Uh -huh. That they chased me, the cops chased me all around, and then I parked the car for like two weeks. <laughs> so that was something that was completely out of the story, but he knew about it as we wrote it. Mm. And he told them that, because when, when that part happened, he goes, yeah, you remember that? And I was like, wow, yeah. So this is things that we know, because yeah. we, we have more than the four pages on the story. Yeah. We spoke about a, 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 a stream amount of things yeah. that that happened in my life and all that stuff. So there was there was more to it. There was definitely more to it. So th that's one of the things that people don't know about the story. That is something that really happened to me. Yeah. Uh, the part the part about about the, the the thing you know they always remember the racing family, and and all that. It comes from me explaining to him how, like I said, I will go to Brooklyn, I will go this, and, and we didn't know each other, but we're racers, so we, we begin to interact as a family because we're racers. Even if we're going to race each other, we still respect each other as, as racers, not as anything else. After that, we can be whatever. But right now, we're racing, and we're talking about it, and we had that family feeling, and that's what they try to portray as that group. Remember, that group was very tight. Yeah. Um, they ate together, they did everything together. Yeah. Uh, so they portray that. And those were things that we spoke about. And that was stuff that, that he will tell them at, from, from the story as well. Gotcha. And, and people don't know, people don't know anything about that. When he says, I live, I live my life a quarter mile at a time. I used to say that I wanted, I wanted, I was wanted to run 10 seconds so bad, man. Cause that was the, like the hot thing to do back then. You ran tens and it took me forever. I went 11 0 and I stood there for like three years. <laughs> <laughs> so I used to say I live my life 10 seconds at a time. I used to say that. I want to just run that 10 seconds so bad. And when I did, it was like, whoa, like everything off my shoulder, basically. That's that's what that was. No way. So that was your saying. Yeah. So 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 that was that I they kind of flipped it. Yeah. But that was that's what I used to say. Wow. Uh, as we was writing the story, I, I always say, you know, and he kept asking me, when are you gonna run 10? I was like, look, man, I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying, you know. It's not that easy. Don't worry about me. Finish the story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then you know the the guys in the the guys in the West Coast were running tens already, so it was even more pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was more pressure. Got you. So um, it's safe to say that you're you're the real life Toretto. Uh, you can say it up to a way, but that's what people say. Um, I, I never, I never spoke about it. Like, uh, and that's why a lot of people didn't believe it. Yeah. I, I, I never mentioned it. Like, uh, when people used to ask, oh, I heard it was based on a story about you. Yeah. Yeah. I used to, I never talked about it. I didn't talk about it probably until 2009, 2008. Wow. Until like, until like maybe, maybe the number four came out. Yeah. Yeah, when I never related, related myself to it, I wanted to stay away from it because all the all the things that that they portray was not what what I was about. Yeah, and and the minute people ask me, it's like, do you really used to go around and steal trucks? I'm like, dude, it's a story. <laughs> it's Hollywood, you know. What I mean? So it's like, man, I don't even want to talk about this with nobody. Yeah, man. When I heard about the uh, when I heard about the story, it was just so hard to believe, you know, just. Just trying to put everything together and then, but when you see the story and you read it and you just put two and two together, it's, that's actually just the way that things happen, you know? And yeah. well, the story kept getting bigger as more of them kept coming out mm. for the simple fact that every time a movie will come out, 
I will get a call at the shop from somewhere, uh, it, it, like it will be Poland, it will be Spain, uh, the UK, some writer now writing about it. Oh, is this true that this story was about you? And like, yes, okay, so can I interview you? And they will do little interviews here and there. And that's how the story began to surface in the internet. Mm-hmm. Like if you look for the story now, it's in every language. Mm-hmm. Every language you're gonna find it. Uh, like right now, you punch in my name in Google, and everything comes up about the story, about about me, and so that's how the story began to run around in the neighborhood, and that's when people started to to actually come and ask me. Hmm. The first person that interview about me, that, that interview me about the story, was. Um, uh, Ken Griffin, no, let's see, Jeff Jeff Griffin from Turbo Magazine. Okay. The 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 editor. Okay. He's like, look, man, I want to write. That's when Turbo Magazine was about to end, and he's like, I really want to talk about this story because nobody has talked about it, and like he will be he will be at every race with us taking pictures of the events and all that. And we never had a chance to talk about the story. Mm-hmm. And we actually did it through the phone. Mm-hmm. And then he sent somebody to take pictures, uh, pictures of, of me here so he can complete the story. So we did the story on the phone. Then he sent somebody to the shop and he took different pictures of me and all that, and the pictures he had and he combined it. And then he wrote, he wrote the story and he came out on Turbo Magazine. Gotcha. That's when it, it really got out because a, a lot of the enthusiasts was reading Turbo Magazine and that's where the, the oh, I don't believe this, mm. the story started to come out. I'm like, look, he wrote about it. I told the story. If you want to believe it, you believe it. If not, <laughs> you know, it doesn't make me or break me, man. <laughs> yeah. But people started getting more information and at that time, you know, the internet was coming around and all that stuff. So... And the word started to get around, and then people started to realize, wow, it, it, it is true. The story is true. Got you. So let's go back to uh, the end of the first movie. You know, the thing that happens with the, the DVD, it gets pulled. Uh, what are your overall feelings about, uh, you know, the movie, the way that everything went, and then you seen something that was based off of you turning into its own entity and just skyrocketing out of this world? Well, they, they, the, the pulling didn't hurt me that they pulled it. It, it, it didn't, it didn't matter to me. Like I said, at that time, I didn't want to be part of it mm. anyway. Um, I was actually disgusted from it with all, with all the dirty things that, that Hollywood has. <laughs> and, and, and the, the portray that I was getting from it wasn't a nice image either. Yeah. The, the way I would get it, oh, it was, that was the story about that. So, oh, so you used to steal and ah, you used to do this. Got so, you. So, so, so I'm trying to run away from that image because I'm running a shop and I don't want that image portrayed, you know, me, me being portrayed as that, mm-hmm. right? And, and neither did Javier. So, so it, it was, it was, it was a while between that be, before I started to actually embrace that. Yeah. Okay. The story is about me and, and, and all that. And like I said, that's why a lot of people didn't believe it. Cause they're like, well, he don't even talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> One of the most critical parts to any build is the clutch. Without a proper clutch, you won't be able to get that power to the wheels. No one wants to spend hundreds of dollars on a clutch that won't hold their power for more than a few races or spirited drives. It is important to go with a clutch that you know that you can count on. That's why many people choose Action Clutch over the competition. Action Clutch offers OEM replacements all the way to 1200 plus horsepower that can be found everywhere from street cars, drag cars, and even formula drift vehicles. Action Clutch makes all their kits here in the USA with materials sourced locally in Los Angeles. Not only is Action Clutch made in the USA, they have also made a strong focus this year to give back a percentage of sales back to the community during these hard times, providing impacted families with groceries and other necessities. Contact Action Clutch today with whatever you need and you will receive the family treatment. You can find their product line at actionclutch.com. If you don't see what you need, please feel free to call them at 323 329-6051. Two six nine six zero five one. You can also DM them on Instagram at Action Clutch or email them at sales at actionclutch.com. If you need help choosing a kit, Action Clutch can get you set up with the right kit for your build. 
Yeah, when I uh, when I found out about it, it was more a, a, a secret kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it was going around. That's that's basically it was going around. But um, but but the, mo- the my answer to everybody always was, you know, Google my name. <laughs> that was my answer. And when people did, it's like, wow, oh, it is true, it is true. So yeah. yeah. And then more more and more people were writing about it, and and more people were saying. That, that this was that, that this was true and actually going into Google and look at it the, the way I said it, and then the story um, kept popping up and popping up and popping up but when it really got big was in 2015 when Vibe did their reunion mm. that's when a lot of people say wow it was true because they actually interviewed us for like an hour and it was him and I mm. Ken mm-hmm. and I talking about all the things we want to now somebody else is actually saying yes this is the guy the guy who actually wrote the story saying this is the guy here yeah and and that that particular uh thing was going to be bigger because uh ben was supposed to 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 be in it but and uh, and michelle also uh-huh. But they had it was it was conflict with the schedule and they couldn't make it so vibe didn't want to lose the opportunity uh, as they saw it, they saw it as an opportunity that it is the 15 year anniversary and they wanted they wanted to do the, the story. And okay. and at that time I was online. So they got a lot of views of that of that interview and it was done on my shop. Wow. So after that interview, did you notice uh, any of that attention come over back to the shop? Yeah, everything. A lot of a lot. Man, people came around with the Turbo magazine so I can sign them. I'm like, dude, that's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> I had a guy get out in the middle, it parked in the middle of the uh, of the door of the shop, like in the in the street, get out and say, yo, I saw the Vibe magazine, man. Can you sign my thing? I'm like, you're kidding, right? Because you come to the shop all the time. You're kidding, dude. <laughs> it was funny. Yeah. It, it was really funny. It was really funny. But I, I signed it for him. I signed it for him. And and I got I got I started to get a lot more attention. Yeah, after that. Yeah. Did you just not think it, it was as big of a deal as it was uh, to you that it would be to other people? Um, I mean, I guess I just I, I just, you know I, I'm a regular guy. I'm not a I'm not a person that like to be in the in the limelight or anything like gotcha. that. So I, I took it as I'm just I'm the same guy no matter what. Yeah. But and, and then seeing these people coming up to me like, oh, oh yeah, this, there's nothing I can say. Like, what can I say? Look, yeah, the, the article was written about me and the article was a movie. That's it. <laughs> it's not like I'm on one of the actors in the movie. <laughs> you know? Hey, well, you still have a chance. They're probably going to go to 15. So maybe we'll see you on yeah, Fast and Furious 13. If we, listen, if this pandemic wouldn't have happened, they would have had, they would have had number, I think they're number nine, right? Nine or 10, one of them. Number nine, yeah, and number nine is 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 kind of personal. Yeah, which which is 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 something funny because somehow, some way, they get out of the out of out of the racer X story. Uh-huh. But whenever they want to bring something back, they go back to the story. Yeah. Like after Tokyo Drift, right? Mm-hmm. Remember, and Diesel wasn't in that movie. Yeah, and when they come back, I think it's number four. Uh-huh. Uh, after Tokyo Drift. It, it, it starts this way. It goes somewhere in the Dominican Republic, and then all of a sudden, Ben Diesel comes out, and supposedly that he left the Dominican Republic, and now he's back, and that's how they bring him back in into the series. Mm-hmm. So every time they want to do something, they do that. So number nine, as what I am told, I, I, I haven't seen the clips, but I, I know people get back to me still to this day with stuff, because people that work... Um, here in New York, and they still work with Universal, and I get some some hints of what's going to happen. So in number nine, there is that's why I remember he's he he released some clips that says fatherhood. Mm-hmm. So in number nine, he goes back to the Dominican Republic because his father passed away. Mm. So it's 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 weird, and I don't want to think about it like that. But it's like, do they actually? go back to the story and follow my life because in 2012 my father did pass away so oh, wow. it could be a coincidence but why would they bring that type of thing into into this movie now they never spoke about you know Toronto's father or anything like that mm-hmm. so it, it puts me to think but 
you know, it is it is what it is. If they uh, is if they contact you and wanted you to be a part of the the series, would you do it? I would, but I don't think they they'll contact me. Really? No. He he, Vin has never wanted to talk to me. He goes to the Dominican Republic a lot, and he's been in places where I'm around, and he won't he won't talk to me. Really? Yeah. That connection's never happened. Do you think he? Do you think him as an actor can understand the significance of the the part that that you bring to it with him not really being part of the culture? Mm, I, I don't. I I think in a way he does, but uh, I really don't get why he wouldn't want to contact me because he actually when I forgot what what number was it was two thousand eight so whatever that number of the movie was, I think it was seven. He went to Washington Heights to promote it. Huh. He promoted it on 174th Street. He put a big, he closed the street, he did a big thing there, and he was there. He knew I'm from Washington Heights, so you're gonna promote that, might as well contact, but no, there was no contact at all, so. Wow. I guess he knows the value of going after. Um, A lot of people say that most of the the movies that the Fast and the Furious that were based on more or less cars mm-hmm. made less money than the newer mm. ones with the with all the all the crazy crashing and all the stunts and all that stuff. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe maybe he doesn't see the value in that. That's what I can say. Yeah. Well, we can. We can definitely see it, man. Yeah. And for everybody listening right now, it just takes a quick Google search to uh, put two and two together. But uh, I've definitely done my research and. This story is 100% true and mind-blowing, too. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just, it, it It always goes back to you do something and you don't realize what it can actually be doing for the future. You just do it, you know, uh, just from Javier's point. He's putting two and two together, which he's always good at. He sees that it's Kenneth's dream to have an article in Vibe magazine. And he needs to have somebody who is a real racer. You being his business partner, he's like, hey, my guy Ralphie right here, perfect dude. Yep. And, um, you know, that, that's just the seed that just needed to be planted in the universe. And then everything just took off from there. But the, uh, the creation of that series, this story, and everything that's come after it is, is the reason for so many uh, automotive enthusiasts from, it, from the start of it. Yep. You know, especially the for myself, you know, I wasn't really into imports or anything like that. I was more on the muscle car side of things, but you know, the what? In, in the muscle cars. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so you, you did it backwards. Yeah. You did it backwards. <laughs> yeah, I did it backwards. Well, at least for me, you did it backwards. <laughs> yeah, so when I first uh one of my first cars, it was actually my second car was a 69 Chevelle. So, oh, okay. yeah, I was into that. But then, you know, you watch the movie and I see that. And I'm telling my dad, hey, I want to put underglow on my Chevelle. He's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> but that that movie was the it was the seed that planted in so much of us that birthed the uh, the passion that we have to this day, man. And, you know, we have yeah, yeah. we have you to thank for it. Yeah, it really did a lot, a lot for the for the import scene. Uh, you know, that's when, when Naira decided to do all the events and then NHRA came and did all the events and the events here in the East Coast were like packed, man. English town used to get, you know, 14,000, 15,000 people in the stands. Yeah. Which was huge. That's, you know, those, that's like, that's, that's the, the, the era of the movie, 2001, 2002. That's when English Town used to get all these all these fans, and it was it was big. Yeah, so let's let's get into that. So after the movie, uh, but before the movie, you know, this is just a uh, it's kind of a small underground thing, the street racing, and then uh, after the movie comes out, what what are things like? And yeah, what is it like? Uh, you know, modding Hondas now. What is it like at the track? What is what is the um, what is the re- reception that you guys are getting now from, you know, the older guys, the muscle car guys? Okay. Well, at that time, uh, I, I started to build the, 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 my car in, in 1990, I got it in 98. Mm-hmm. By 99, I was already racing it. Okay. Um, it was, it, I got, I got the car from, uh, 
uh, a junkyard that actually picked up the cars. They used to pick they, they used to pick up cars in the street, and then the city used to let them keep it, and just just to get them out of the street. So they will pick them up. So what they wanted was the engine and and few of the parts back because I'm not going to use them anyway. I was going to take the interior, all that. So whatever I was going to take off, just dismantle it for them, give it to them, and keep the body, which is what the deal that I made. And they gave me that body, which I think I was one of the first EKs. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody had an EG or, or, or an EF mm-hmm. back then. So I was one of the first EKs. So I have not no data, nothing on that, on that car. So it took me a while to get it to run good because everything was different on the EK. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the way the motor sat, everything was different. Uh, so by 99, I started running it. Um, I think it was 2000 that we decided to make a twin turbo, which started out as a joke. That started out as a joke because um, I didn't tune the car back then. Uh, uh, Joe Spetter Sr. Mm-hmm. from Turbo People out here used to used to tune the car and he used to do a lot of mustangs and a lot of, uh, of muscle cars the import side came from me i kept bringing them the imports and it was it was funny to him because he's like oh this is half of a motor yeah <laughs> <laughs> so he used to build these twin turbos of 5.0s and make all this power he goes I wonder what would happen if we make this thing twin turbo if it'll be better yeah because we tried putting a big turbo in remember we didn't have the technology we have now on turbo, so it was it was a lot different. It was it was a lot different the, the technology then, so it wouldn't work. Like we tried to put a '66 on, on on the car, and it was like really laggy, and it was it was hard to drive, and all that. It didn't. Work. It was hard to drive, so so we decided, oh, oh let's make a twin turbo. I'm like, you gotta be joking. Uh, he's like, look. I'm going to get everything. I'll call Turbonetics. I get everything. I'll supply everything. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. I go back to Cooks again. Now Cooks looking at me like, oh, okay, what are you doing? I said, look, we got to make this thing twin turbo. This is going to be the first import twin turbo Honda. And he goes, you guys are joking. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm not joking. He, I leave you the car. So he came up with a design that, I got, I got the header here somewhere still. Uh-huh. So I, I never get rid of that header. Yeah. That's how much I pay for it. I said, look, <laughs> I'd rather just see it there. I'm not giving it away. <laughs> I'm not doing anything. So he came up with a design that came up and came down. Okay. So it's almost it's almost like a like a like a, a, a up up pipe but backwards. Got gotcha. you. Right? Like a top mount but backwards. So he made it, he goes, Look, I made the twin turbo header. But this is two headers in one. Mm. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, well, since I think you guys are joking, I made it so you can put two T3s, which is what you're going to use, two little small turbos. And if it doesn't work for you guys, then you can just take this off and a T4 will fit right on it (laughs) facing forward. (laughs) Facing forward because my turbos were facing forward. Yeah. So I said, oh, great, great. you know, it cost me an arm and a leg, but at least if this don't work, I got, I, I'll go back to my old stuff, but I'm back, I'm back in business. Yeah. So the the messed up part is that since he did that, he made the turbo too low because mm. he said that the header should have a certain length and it has to be that length. I'm like, dude, can you just make it shorter so it's not that low? Because what am I going to do? He goes, I don't know, put a pump or something. <laughs> so we had to put a well done pump with with like a little can yeah so the drain will go into the can and the pump will pump it back into the motor because oh, it was low yeah and the car turned out to be pretty good i mean we ran 949 you know we went out to the first um nhra that's when jojo ran eight eight something i think 870 he ran in that in that event in gainesville uh-huh. and uh we ended up you know to the semifinals, and i, I lost I lost to the Venom car because I actually rolled. I would have beat the Venom car that day and went to the finals. So Kenny Tran ended up winning that. That that. Race. Oh, you red lit it? Yeah. Oh, got gotcha. you. The car rolled on me. The car rolled on me, and I ended up red lit. So I was out. I was out in the in the, in the semifinals, 
and it was it was Venom and and Kenny Trent to the to the finals, and Kenny Trent ended up winning. So because Venom was hurt by that time, I could have beat him. So I go at the end, oh man, good run. He goes, you gave it to me. I'm like, dude, okay, stop. <laughs> <laughs> so what year was this? 2001. 01, and you did uh, that first, not that was the first ever NHRA event. And what motor was that in the EK? A B series. So it's twin turbo. Twin turbo B series. Oh yeah. shit! There's pictures. There's pictures of that in the in the internet as well, as well as video from English Town. Yeah. Running the car. So what were some of the uh, the benefits and downfalls of the uh, twin turbo setup? Well. The benefit of the twin turbo was that it was a very responsive car. Remember, we didn't have any strain gauge, any any clutchless trannies, so we would have to clutch in, shift, and no matter how fast you did it, there'll be a drop on the car. Mm. So that's why the big turbo wouldn't work. We didn't have the technology we have now that you know we run tremendous amount of boost and the turbo keeps keeps up with it. So it was a very responsive car. Like I can get off the throttle, get back in it, and it was right there. Mm. Boost was there. So it was a very consistent car. For a front wheel drive, it was very consistent. I would run the same ET all the time mm-hmm. because it, 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 of the response of, of, of the turbo. Yeah. Um, as as NHRA came in, I was going to run the second year, and at the middle of the year, they asked me. Oh, are you gonna continue to run that twin turbo? I'm like, well, I might, but I can run a single turbo. They go, I said, why? Why are you asking me? The reason is because we're gonna ban it. I'm like, what do you mean you're gonna ban it? Mm. <laughs> so NHRA did ban it for the for the for the next year, and uh, actually the next year is when I decided to not run the car anymore because I said when I went to run NHRA, I said I would run to the to the half of the year, the first six races. And if I didn't pick up any sponsors or anything, I will, I will, I will drop off. Gotcha. And I was 30 in points. I was 30 in points when I dropped off uh-huh. on, on the series. But I just couldn't continue. It was the traveling and the shop and leaving the shop. You know, I would have to leave for a week or two. Yeah. If I didn't pick up a sponsor, it was it can't work out. It, it couldn't work out. So I, I stopped racing in, in for the two, at, the, at the middle of 2001. Got you. So what did you focus on after that? I focused more on the shop and, and things to do. And then uh, I was growing older and family, kids, everything. So I started to focus more on that and and realized that I wanted to sell the car to buy a house. Got you. That was my thing. Oh, I'm going to sell the car to buy a house. And then I realized that, yeah, I do have a lot of money in the car, but nobody's going to give me that kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like, okay, I can't explain this to the wife. <laughs> this is, this is, this is a no-no here. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you want to commit suicide. <laughs> oh. So um, I decided to part the car, the car out. Okay. Uh, I saw the, the, I had a, I had a couple of spare motors, spare parts, uh, rims. So I saw the car as a roller, mm-hmm. and I ended up. I ended up making up like 30 grand out of the whole thing. With I spent a tremendous amount of money. Yeah. And with that, I said, look, I'm just going to, you know, shift my life a different a different way now. Uh, go out there and look for a house and, 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 you know, and see how it goes. And there's always time for racing. There's always time for racing. And I was working on the shop. I was busy at the shop. So I'm like, you know, I'll just move along with, with my life and, and help people out with, with racing. And it was like that for for a while, until a customer came in and, and tells me, "Oh, I'm going to buy a race car." I said, "Okay, cool. That's that's I'm glad I'm glad you are." <laughs> yeah, but they giving me this car for uh, this amount of money. What do you think? I'm saying it's a good deal. You know, think about it. If you can you build it, the thing you got to figure out is can you build it with that amount of money? Yeah. And he looks at me. I said, no, you can't build it. With that amount of money, you're telling me you can't build it. So he goes, okay, so it's a good deal. I said, I think it's a good deal because you can't build it. So even if you part it out, you make some money on it. He goes, okay, but the only way I'll buy it is if you drive it. I'm like, okay, no, <laughs> hold on. I've been, I've been out of this for a little while, and I'm doing okay. I got responsibilities. 
And if I go back to racing, uh, you know how it is. I need a turbo, mortgage, turbo, mortgage, <laughs> turbo. <laughs> and you got the little devil yeah. here pitching you. Yeah. <laughs> Twin turbo. <laughs> And I was like, oh, man, oh, God, you got to give me an answer. I said, okay, give me a few days. I'll think about it. Uh, he came back, and I said, look, all right, I'll drive it. If you if you pay for it and you put everything, I'll drive it. Yeah. And and that's how I got back in, 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 into this car here. Uh, okay. Was into, in, uh, into the Corolla. was like that. Now, that's I the got back El, El Coche a, Bomba? Back. Yeah, Coche Bomba. Correct. What is it? That, that was... That was the original name from when the guy bought the car, so he just kept it with the same name. And the reason why he got that name was because the original owner was at Acro once, and and he actually accidentally touched the nitrous before he started, and he started the car, and the whole intake hood and everything blew off the car. <laughs> <laughs> the hood flew like 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 half a mile. <laughs> So, so that's what they call it, Coche Bomba, because it blew, it, it blew everything up there, the intake and the hood and everything. What is, what is that? Uh, what does that translate to? Uh, like car bomb. The, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, that's what that's what it translates. And to. now that and that's a two JZ uh, Corolla that you're still racing yep. to this day, right? Yeah, so I'm still racing to the day. Got way more involved now, but yeah. Yeah, man, it looks like uh, things just ramped up for you. I was going back in your Instagram, and you're touching all kinds of different cars, man. BMWs, yeah. the Toyotas, the Formula Drift stuff. You're all over. Yeah, yeah I do a lot of... Uh, I, I started to do a lot of road racing cars, and because um, uh, that's really where my roots began. Like, I, 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 I was... a. Uh, I, I was a street racer, but I was a uh, I ran I ran road racing cars in '92 back in Dominican Republic. I, I used to go back and, and drive that. I was sponsored by Quaker State, mm. and I did that for like three years. Um, I was always top three out there, so I, I really enjoyed driving uh, on a road on a road course more than drag racing. Got you. More than drag racing, actually. Yeah. Because um, you know it's, it's it's a longer period of time and is. It, it actually pushes your skills more than anything because you have to be perfect more than one more than one lap. Yeah. So, so it's it, it's, it's it, it, I got back into it when I started to tune the cars as as um, people in the Dominican Republic started to buy um, really high end high end cars. They needed you know we needed to see data. We needed to do fix a lot of stuff, and I had a lot of experience in it. Not only in the mechanical side, but the driving side uh, as well. So it, it was it was a, a, a big plus for me, and I started picking up really good customers out there. And uh, at first, uh, the the traveling was fun, and then it started to be like, oh, I gotta travel, and it's like you know a whole day yeah. and stressful. But it, it was part of the job. And um, yeah, I, I really, I, uh, to this day, I, I do a lot of that, and uh, and I enjoy it. I really enjoy that. Now, when did you realize that you had a, a skill in tuning? In in tuning, it started back back with when when Joe Spetta Senior was tuning my car. Um, he was he was older than me. So he was like a mentor to me, almost like my second father. I, I always, uh, to this day, we, we talk. I talk to his son, cause, and he was like in, in, in a part where he really didn't wanna, didn't wanna continue to tune. So I would look at him tuning, and then sometimes he would tell me, okay, he'll, he will stop somewhere, he'll go get like coffee or cigarettes, and he'll go here, input these numbers here, put put all these, lower all these numbers by one, and all this, so I started looking. We would remember, this is back when there was no windows, it was just DAS, this is MS DAS, the windows. Mm. So everything was a command, everything was a command, so it was, and it was only fuel and ignition, you didn't have all these strategies and all these things to do now. So I was at an early, early stage of the tuning process. So he was actually on, on his way out. He didn't want to do it anymore. So it was getting to be, oh, when can I go to him? Oh, let me see. Let me... All 
All right, we're back. Got it. So he's 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 yeah. getting out of tuning. So he's getting out of tuning. So he's like, oh, I'm gonna have Joby, uh, Joe Junior, tune your car. I'm like, oh, I don't know. I, I don't know how I feel about that. You always tune my car, and you know we get along, and we were a different age. Like he would relate to me towards towards his son, but we're not in the same age group. So I see him younger than me. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know about this. You know, young kids are kind of crazy. Yeah. And, you know, we're kind of slow down guys here. We we talk about things before we do it. And we <laughs> rationalize yeah. one way or the other. I don't know how I'm going to do it. Nah, you're going to be okay. So he took my car for a couple of a couple of uh, times. And we kept making changes. And then, you know, um, uh, it was as early he was starting. So I'm like, I'm seeing that. Like, he's learning with my car. So why don't I just learn, man? So at that time, I know that uh, Gen 7 for DFI was going to come out, which was a Windows ECU, a better ECU and all that. And at that time, I was I was getting a lot of promise that I will get the Gen 7, that, you know, I'm going to do a lot of research for Excel because he was a big Excel guy. But that didn't happen. And then I was using... I was I was beginning to see this computer called Gems that was from the UK. So I'm like, well, I'm not getting this DFI thing. So I'm looking at these gems because I, I, I was I was seeing rally cars. And there was a Irish guy that came to my shop that goes, Man, look, I'll trust you, man. Just tune my stuff. Don't worry about it. If it breaks, it breaks. Don't worry. I know you can do it. So he pushed me to do it a lot. And we would do it in the street. And all that. So I got familiar with that with that computer. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna probably buy one of these and put it in my car. But when I call Gems, they tell me, no, we can't sell to you. What do you mean you can't sell to me? That's because I'm in the United States or or what? Because they're they're in the UK. Mm-hmm. So they go, no. If you want to buy any of our products, you got to contact this company called AEM. Mm. AEM, what the hell? AEM don't. What the hell they got to do with this? I knew John at the time, but John was building intakes. Yeah. And John has sold the company at that time. So when I, I tried to contact them, they gave me the number. I called them. And then I find out from Jason, Jason Siebels at the time, that, that yes, I can buy the ECU through him and all this. At that time, there wasn't an AEM yet. Mm. So I get these gems and I put it on a car. But they come out with the AM and then I find out that Kurt is working there. Mm. And that's how I get into AM in into AM. And this is 2001 when I went to, to NHRA. When I went to NHRA, I was the first car to run 940s on an AM. Wow. Because uh, nobody understood the computer. But since I have already done stuff that is gems that is some something like it i can i understood what it was and i and i learned i learned that was the, the first time i started to tune i just said look i'm gonna i'm not gonna let anybody learn with my car i'm just might as well learn and that's how i got into tuning and you know like everything else i mean because people always criticize somebody when when somebody starts like oh it blew up well if you don't blow up stuff you're never gonna learn yeah because it's like everybody says you know you have to fall get up and then start walking again. That's that's the way things end. The, the bad thing is when you don't learn from your mistakes. But, you know, we're all humans. We're going to make them uh, one time or another. And I, I made a lot. And the more you blow up, the more you learn. <laughs> you know, that brings me to a, a, a quote of yours that I wanted to, to go over. It says, never stop working. Always continue to better yourself. And what you do, keep your mind open and learn. When did you realize the importance of of knowledge and um, that you never stop learning? Well, up to this day, up to this day is the same way. The thing is, the way the way this industry has come to me, it wasn't handed in a silver platter. I had to work for everything I have, and most people don't realize that, especially when you're young. I'm I'm 53 now. I, I have a way, you know, different outlook on, on things. And I, and, I, and, and, and I have the experience. I can go back and say, well, if I can do that now, I will do with that. Not that I have any regrets of anything that I do, but I won't make the same mistakes I made way then, back then. So you know, it's always a learning curve. I didn't go to school for this. I didn't graduate high school. 
my my highest you know my highest level of high school is the 11th grade and not because i failed i never i was up to every year i passed just in the 11th grade i said i'm into cars i gotta make money goodbye mm -hmm. i don't need this so it wasn't like yeah oh i'm gonna fail or or or, 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 or i can't make it to the next grade no i just i couldn't hold it one more year i said that's it man i gotta go make money you know this is I'm thinking a different story. I need a car. I'm doing this. I got into the car thing. And that's probably why I made the most out of it. Because I said, this is what I got to do. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's a constant it's a constant learning, learning curve from day one. And I had to learn everything I know, how to build an engine, how to, how to drive a car, how to tune a car. Everything's been hands-on. And there's no better way if you have the time. Most people go to school thinking that it's going to be a faster process. Yeah. Maybe it can be for them to get to understand things, but the experience of being hands-on can never be beaten. Definitely. That, that, I mean, think about it. A doctor go to school for four years to become a doctor. What does he have to do? A whole year free for the hospital to get hands-on because in theory, everything is perfect. Yeah. But when you're there in that operating room, you know, a life is big, so what are you gonna do? So it's uh, I, and I look at, at at mechanics as doctors. The only thing is, like I always say, our, our patient could die, and we just get another. One. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's a constant learning learning experience. Oh man, I love it! What a story, bro! You've uh, <laughs> you've had a life, man. <laughs> I love it. So let's fast forward to, to present day, man. What is uh what is life like for you today? Um, three years ago, I decided uh, I, I I was twenty years in the same spot in Woodside, New, um, New York, in in Queens. I was for twenty years there. Um, I when when I bought the house, I bought the house in Jersey. So it, I I used to tr I used to travel every day, and it was only an eighteen mile travel, but. It would take me an hour and a half to get there. Mm. And you guys in the West Coast could know, know how traffic is. Yeah. Traffic is something like Definitely. that. Definitely. Uh, and then I just decided I had it. I, I, I wanted to come to Jersey. And uh, I found a, a, a spot here in, in South Amboy. I used to actually come and tune for the guy um, that's, that's actually um, with me here. And he said, look, there's an open space. You want to move there? And when I move here, I, it's the same size. But my expenses came down a tremendous amount. Mm -hmm. So it was really a no-brainer for the move. Uh, and when I was going to move, my landlord actually even asked me, hey, if there's anything I can do? Because I mean, I've been there for 20 years, no problems with the guy. Mm. <laughs> so I don't think he wanted me to leave. But I'm like, no, I'm just, it's just, you know, I, I really, I couldn't grow where I was. And at the time I was looking at, like, yeah, I want to I wanna grow more. Yeah. I want to move and I want to grow. Once I move here, I was so calm. And it's one of the things that Javier talks about. I talked I talk to Javier about a lot about that. And when I came here, I, I had something happen to me. I, um, my, my eye started to get blurry mm. and I thought I was losing my sight. And uh, what happened was is I, I um, actually had uh, my retina in the back had holes, and uh, that's what the doctor explained to me. And I was getting water in front of my eyes, and it was getting blurry. So this happened to me all of a sudden. I never had any issues, and I asked him what happened. And he goes, well, you have a lot of stress. I'm like, no, dude. You got the wrong guy. I don't have stress. Yeah. So he kept telling me, yes, that's that's the only way that happens, and it happens at your age. So whether you think or not, you do have some stress. I said, whatever, you know, how can we take care of this? He said, oh, we'll take care of it right away. I said, no, 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 you're not operating me on my eye. You got to tell me what you got to do. <laughs> so he says, no, I just go in there, and I cover the holes, and you go back to work. I said, oh, okay, if I go back to work. So he did it. I was good. Then I moved, like probably three to four months after I moved here. And the first day I came into this shop was the first day that I realized how much stress I had when I was in New York. Wow. It took, it took that for me to realize it. So I'm saying, I, that's when I said, wait a minute, I, do I really want to grow or do I want to stay where I'm at and, and have less stress? 
and that's the route that I took. And here I'm a lot more, I'm a lot calmer here. Um, everything is a lot calm. You don't have, and, and when people think about stress, they think it's just because you have problems. No, it's the pressure of the traffic, the, the city and all the noise and all these things. So it, it was, a, it, when he said stress, I said no, but he just didn't explain the kind of stress. When I came and sat here, that everything is quiet, that I can come in the back of the shop and work with, with no noise, no nothing, and get more concentrated, I say, oh, now I understand what he's talking about stress. Yes, I did have it. Mm. So you didn't even realize that the atmosphere that you were living in was stressful. Correct, correct. So it took me to move and see a different picture, because that's what I saw when I moved here. I actually saw a different picture, and I realized myself that, wow, I did have it. Yeah. So uh, life is a lot calmer for me here. Uh, I actually get more done. I actually get more done here. And it's, it's, it's working out pretty good for me. I love it, man. That's a, it's an amazing story. So say if somebody were to go to, uh, to the shop, DRT Racing, South Amboy, New Jersey, what are some of the uh, services that you provide and do you sell parts in store? Yep, I sell I saw a, 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 all the I'm a dealer for all the major um, ECUs. Uh, I've been for years. Uh, AEM being one of the biggest, I give a lot of feedback on it as well. Um, Motec dealer, Howtech dealer, um, you, you name it. We we, we mostly a, a dealer for and and tune it as well. Install it, tune it. Nowadays, I'm doing more engine builds. And it's crazy because it's mostly two JCs. Yeah. Everybody's coming with two JCs since I have it. Yeah. Uh, than than anything else, uh, I do a lot of tunes for Honda. The other day, I did a a, a, a tune that that brought me back a lot of memories. Or uh, is it, the guy is a friend of mine actually, but it was a B series. And people talk about a B series. Uh, I mean, the Honda the Honda community at all have lost respect for for the b-series other than the sport front wheel drive yeah uh, sport front wheel drives are the only one using it mm -hmm. and you know i in 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 2000 i made like 240 horsepower out of a out of a b-series which was unheard of and this guy wanted to build a b-series and he built the motor himself and everything but i i helped him out with a lot of stuff and i tuned the the vehicle and we actually made 291 it was like a month or two ago and it was it was something that brought me back and I got really into tuning the car and I, as I'm posting on Instagram, it happened to be that nice ones was here and he did a video yeah and everything because he saw the, the how hype I was about tuning this thing and it's like it, it, it was grassroots for me it was going back to 97 2000 you know yeah uh, uh, and, 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 and I remember, I remember Felix uh, coming in, uh, Felix Medina coming in and say, "If you make two fifty, I give you thousand dollars." I'm like, "Look, I'm already at two fifty, man." <laughs> oh man, I'm already at two sixty. So hold on, we're gonna we're gonna make more than this. I love it, and man. It's ones with, with uh, which is pretty decent for something that you know nowadays. Everybody's running all these type of fuels that they 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 they, they mix this with that and. Uh, you know, this was plain M1, just an alcohol car, M1, no mix, no nothing. So it was very impressive to make the 291. And, and it actually felt good that, you know, that, that, that I went back to something that I used to do a lot before. Very cool, man. I love it. Yeah. So speaking of tuners, um, l l let's try to give some flowers to some of the, uh, the younger tuners out in the, uh, the tri-state area. Who are some tuners that, that you know that are putting in the work and they're, um, they're putting out some awesome, uh, awesome results? Nowadays, that's, that's the, the good thing about, about the industry, how, I, how it has evolved. Um, when, when I started, there was very, very few tuners. That's why, one of the reasons why it was always packed. But there's a lot of, of great tuners out here. You know, Felix Medina being one. He actually moved right here, right behind me now. Got you. Uh, um, he's, he's one of the, the guys that are, that, are, that are on the move now. Um, yeah, we, we have a lot of people in the, in the, in the tri-state. Definitely. It's, it's funny how I go black. Your Solo is a big Honda guy. Your solo, mm -hmm. your solo is doing doing a lot, a lot of Honda tunes around here too, and 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 uh, and, and showing his work out there. Um, 
you know, that, that's, that's, there's, a, there's a numerous amount of, of guys. Like before you had one or two dinos around the Tri-State area. Now you got dinos everywhere and, and, and guys doing their thing. Yeah. And not only in the New York area, all over the country. Before you couldn't find as many tuners all over, you know, in the different part of the countries. People who come from other states yeah. to, tune, to tune to DRT as far as Virginia and as far as Maine, North. So... It was it, it wasn't that many people. Now you got guys in Massachusetts, Connecticut, uh, all all tuning, you know. Yeah. So with you being in the community since you know mid '80s to uh, to this day, still uh, still wrenching and tuning. What are some of the things that you've noticed with the the change of the community? You know, with social media, with the growth of everything. Where do you foresee all of this going to? Well. The electronics are moving faster than people now. Uh, every other day, you have like like I said when when we first started when I first started it was it was in DAWs it wasn't even in Windows and we didn't have any strategies. What I mean by strategies, all we could do is move ignition and fuel. We didn't have anything else. Now you have strategies on traction control, on turning something on, or making something work. The uh, computer does more than just run the engine nowadays. And in the new cars, is even more complex. Because the computer, you take it out and it runs everything in the car. The dash, the, 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 all, the, all the controls for the air conditioning, sometimes the radio. So it's getting more challenging to actually do the programming because there's more involved in it. It's not just programming the fuel now now you got to make everything work yeah now you got to make the tranny shift now you got to make the the rpm on the dash work because it works through a canvas it's not it's not a it's not something where you run a wire anymore so there's a lot more programming going on than just the computer nowadays uh when we do like a, a on a rail on a road racing car i happen to start learning at an early age how to mess around with a canvas that that open up that for me, which was a whole new era of tuning for me, because now I'm putting something that's going to, a little box that's going to control all the power in the car. I have to program that the right way. And now it's, 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 and it's a challenge. So you get into it all over again. Yeah. Whenever, uh, that's the way I look at, at what I do. It has to be challenging. And I think that's why we all get into, into, into something is for passion and you understand that you're going to make something better and that you're going to that make this thing come alive. And that's what gives you that energy to continue. Ralphie, I love it, man. Hey, uh, I wanted to thank you for uh, sharing your story with me, man. It was, it was awesome and very motivating for sure. Sure. I want to thank you and, and everybody that's listening out there to this. I definitely, definitely thank you for the time and, and, and for taking interest in in. And this little guy here, this old guy. <laughs> hey, just like you've shown, man, no matter how small the shop is or what, everybody has their impact. And uh, you don't know where your impact can uh, can can take you, man. And it's uh, yeah, it's definitely it. helped out the, the world for sure. That's it. That's it. Awesome, man. So, uh, Ralph, before we get out of here, where can people find you at? And uh, if they want to contact you for some services. Well, I got a, we have a website, drtracing.com. And we're on every social media, Facebook. I'm not on TikTok yet. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just killing me for that. <laughs> I'm in Instagram, DRT Racing, and also Facebook, DRT Racing. I love it, man. We'll have it. Uh, we'll have the uh, information below. And um... yeah, and and I'm actually gonna gonna like I said, I'm gonna open the the DRT Racing channel on YouTube, and that's something that is gonna. It's, I'm gonna link that up with my Instagram. Because I want to ask people what they want to, what they want, what they want to see, yeah. and ask them questions in what they want to learn. Because what I want to do is give some of that knowledge back to the industry that I got in over the years. Yeah. So if I, I would ask a question, what do you want to see? Me build a head, me build an engine, explain anything, explain electronics, anything, and I will do 
the the I will, I will put it on the on the YouTube channel and and guys can can see their questions being answered. I love it, man. And the YouTube channel's up already, guys. So make sure you guys go subscribe right now. YouTube.com slash DRT Racing Channel. Just search DRT yep. Racing Channel. It'll pop up and um, shoot shoot Ralphie a DM and tell him what you'd be interested in uh, seeing him make a video on. Uh, as you guys can see already, he has um, about thirty five years or so of knowledge. <laughs> and uh yeah. yeah man what an awesome story bro i cannot wait to put this out thank you all right, all right. thank you very of much of course man and uh, i wanted to shoot a big thank you to our sponsor heel toe automotive been around since 2002 supplying you guys with your honda parts make sure you guys check them out at heeltoeauto.com and uh next sponsor is rye wire motorsport electronics um wiring geniuses man make sure you guys check them out at ryewire.com or instagram at ryewire underscore motorsport underscore electronics and if you need a clutch like ralph you did needed one back in the day uh we got we got clutch company ready for you now man action clutch clutch is made in los angeles ready to go holding up to uh, 1200 horsepower so you guys don't have to uh, worry about being stuck at 300 and nowhere to go yeah. But, uh, <laughs> man, thank you guys for listening. I hope you enjoy this podcast. And please, please go show Ralphie some support, man. Um, once again, this is Downtime with Downstar, episode 199. And we're out. Peace.